Yeah, sure. Where'd you get a shirt from? I got Altona, a, what's Altona? That's the best club in town. Okay, nice, nice. Yeah. Do you know the TV show Dallas? It's black and white, right? No. Moin Moin and welcome at the Art of Jägerkampfbahn. Today we welcome our captain Dallas Amin Zadeh. Dallas, Moin Moin, thank you for being here. <laughs> thank nice you for me. Thanks, nice to see you. And because you are from the States, we would like to um, do this interview in English. Of course. And um, with this we want to send special greetings to our friends in the south of London. How are you doing this time right now, this special times? Uh, it's definitely not easy. I think uh, everyone can relate with that. Life is all over the place and we're just trying to make, make the most of what we can. Yeah. What do you miss the most? Ah, well, what I miss the most is my, my normal life. You know, I was normally, every day I had training, every mm -hmm. day I was in the gym. Every day? Every day. Every day I would go to the gym before training. And uh, now you take training and the gym out and now I don't know what to do with myself yeah. you know it's tough so so finding things to keep busy um, is definitely one of the tougher tasks how's the mood in the team ah the mood in the team I mean everyone's when we see each other everyone's super happy you know I think the the team is a bit anxious because everyone still is unsure nobody mm. knows what's going on and I think we're just anxious to have an answer so we can set and organized for the future I know yes. so you know keeping keeping in shape you know having a, a goal and achieving a goal and so not knowing what's going to happen is just a, it's just an annoying feeling do you have goals right now for for this time and personal goals or no no goals and team or team or goals okay. with the team what you say well we want to do that now or want to achieve that with the team uh, i mean well, with the season, of course, our main our main priority is, is, is keeping and staying in the league. That's that's the team's yeah. goal. That's our main focus. Um, during the time where we're unsure, during the corona times, our main focus as a goal is just to stay mentally and physically ready and prepared mm -hmm. and, and fit. And that's why uh, every week we would do Zoom trainings, our assistant coach, Philip. Yes, yes. How is it? We heard about it. It's it's interesting. It's something new. It's I've never done it before, but it's a yeah. cool experience, and and I, I, it's better than not doing anything. Mm. And so I think you know every when it works with everyone's schedule, I think it's fun. It keeps us keeps us uh, together, keeps us mm. on beat, and so I think it's important for us. How long is it? An hour a day, or no? Nah, de de depending it? depending on um, depending on the day. Uh, a lot of times we would do it on Sundays, um, mm -hmm. and that's when we would have trainings. So Friday we would train, and then Sunday would be like a light, um, a light Zoom training with regeneration. But um, about two weeks ago, when we were only training one time a week, we would also have a Zoom training during the week. And during that Zoom training, it would be about forty-five minutes to an hour, mm -hmm. and we would break a sweat. So, so it's fun. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's cool. It's definitely cool. <laughs> Um, you are with the Altona 93 now for almost two years. Correct. How is how was the time for you in the club so far? I uh, it's it was amazing. First of all, I love Hamburg as a city. Yeah, yeah. I'm you like it here in Hamburg, uh, Altona? I I'm I'm from DC, Washington DC, so I'm a city boy. And before coming to Hamburg, I was in Oldenburg. Yes, and and Oldenburg is a very small city with with not much to do. Not but it's a do. nice city. We want to send special yeah, greetings yeah. to all our friends it's in Oldenburg. It's a beautiful work. city, don't get me wrong. <laughs> it's a beautiful city. Um, it's just coming, being a city boy, coming from a big city, D.C. compared to Oldenburg. I think Hamburg and D.C. is more comparable. Oldenburg is nice too. 
yeah. yeah. Uh, so so I'm I'm super in love with with, with the yeah. city and uh, last year was totally new for me and again last year we also had a different coach with yes. a different uh, style of play with with different ambitions. For example, one example was last year um, we were we did fitness two three times a week almost or the type of trainings we had was yeah. almost it was high high level high intensity high yeah. conditioning where we would run a lot we would run a lot and this year um we are we focused like for to clear the air we did a lot of running without the ball yeah on my first year yeah and now this year it's a different style it's different type and we're doing fitness but now our fitness is with with the ball mm. and so it's it's interesting to you know i've also seen two groups of, of teammates you know with with last year and this year there's only f a few players that are the same so it's interesting to see the different style of play and, and the quality we have. No. And also we had quality last yeah, of year course, too, of but course. it's just the, you know, last year we played in a 3-5-2. That was the tunnel st uh, mm -hmm. style. This year we play uh, we played a 4-3-3 and we played a 4-4-2. And so you've had to learn the different styles of football plays and, and understanding the tactics and as well as we're doing conditioning but in a totally different way. So... It, it's interesting to to be a part of the different. What do you think about the new coach Bergman? Yeah, I, th I, I think Bergman is great. Um, I, he has you can see for his resume, he's he's had his experience. He's of course he's a profi in yes in every aspect you can think. And and what I like about uh, Bergman is he tries to bring that mentality to 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 us. Um, we have a few older players, including myself, on the team. But generally speaking, the team is a very young team. And I think uh, what Berkman does is he tries to bring his, profi his professionalism mm -hmm. down, whether it's the trainings or whether it's the team talks or um, just in every style of what he does, he, he makes sure you, you're doing it to your best of ability. And you don't do it just to do it, but you do it to be better and yeah. to become better. So one thing with him I really, really like is that um, there's always a reason why you do something. You have Everything you do must have a purpose. Mm -hmm. And... Um, yeah, so his philosophy and his mindset and his and his training styles, I've I've learned, and I think the group, the team, can say that they've also learned. What do you think um, is possible with the team if a regular season would take place? You know me, I'm I'm a realistic, honest person. I think if we have a healthy squad and we're playing to the best of our ability, I think we have a very, we have a lot of potential. And yeah. I, I, if we're playing our potential and we're playing our best thing healthy, I would be personally unhappy or personally frustrated if we don't finish mid or above. Mm. That's where I can see this group and that's 100% honesty. Hopefully that will take place. First we need to play. <laughs> <laughs> If you haven't yet noticed, you were one of the crowd favorites. I mean, you were you. at the cover of the Jans fan scene. Have you seen that? The propeller scene? I haven't. No? No, what? The propeller scene, the little one, where you have the arms like this. Ah, yeah, with the book that yeah, you yeah, yeah, Okay, yeah. okay, okay, cool. Yeah, then, then, yes, okay, then I've seen I mean, that. Come I thought on. it was a video or something. No, 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 no. I, no. Like, I haven't seen it. The propeller scene. No, okay, no, no. Yes, yes, yes. I know. Of course, this. Jan. I, I took a few copies and kept it at the house. Really? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. I think, yeah, I think the illustrations was also great. Yeah. The way they did it. <laughs> How would you describe the football player, Ami Zadeh? Yeah. Whoa, is it a mean question? No, 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 it's an honest question. I like, I like these type of questions. I just want to give the right answer. Uh, yeah, the way I am, I'm, I'm an emotional player. I'm, um, I play with the eye. I play with my heart on my sleeve. I think I'm a, I'm a vocal player. Um, I think I'm also an, I'm an athletic player. Mm -hmm. um, I can tell that. Uh, and um, yeah, the type of player I am is, I think overall. Yeah, I'm, I'm a very calm player, um, and I'm always thinking of the, the other person before myself. And that's uh, also the times I've, I've got myself into trouble during games is because instead of focusing on myself and what I'm supposed to be doing, I'm always thinking about uh, being just, you know, being the backup for everyone else and thinking about, okay, if this went wrong, I should need to, mm, you know, do this. and putting maybe too much 
responsibility on myself and, and too much thought, and then that leads to little dumb mistakes that I would never, would never do. Um, but yeah, overall, I would say um, I'm a motivated player, emotional player, and yeah, a passionate player. Mm. What's your opinion about ghost games? I mean, or I don't know, uh, we in Germany say ghost games. Ghost games. M yeah, basically a game without fans, yeah. I mean, you see how it's going, going now around yeah. the world. I mean, I think it's important for the, for the players to, to play, um, but at the same time, a football match is not a real football match without fans. I think the fans is what brings the, the passion and the energy. And so I, I, for, for health reasons, I, I completely understand, mm. but uh, we need the fans back. Mm. That is so important. Tell us a bit about your past. Uh, like you mentioned, uh, you are from Silver Spring, or were you born in Silver Spring, Maryland, mm -hmm. close to Washington, D.C.? Yeah, uh, borderline D.C., yeah. Did you grow up there, and do you have still friends and family there? Uh, yeah, I grew, I grew up in, in, yeah, born in Maryland, yeah. raised Silver Spring, friends, family, blah, 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 from D.C. And a lot of times DC. I say D.C. is because people won't know what Maryland is. But everybody knows what yeah. DC is. Yeah, of course. And literally from Silver Spring, I could walk 10 minutes on foot and I'm in DC. Yeah. It's right on the border. So, so basically, right. it's DC. Uh, what would you call it? Uh, um, what's it? Yeah, it says Metropolitan. Yeah, metropolitan. In, 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 yeah, metropolitan area. And that's why we have it's called the DMV. And it's for D.C., mm -hmm. Maryland, and Virginia. Ah, okay. Because it's the three states that are all next connected to each mm -hmm. other. And so you're on the border from D.C., five minutes here in Virginia. You're on the border of Virginia, five minutes here in mm -hmm. Maryland. Yeah, so okay. it's all, con and we all view, e see each other as one. The DMV. Really? Maryland, Virginia, in, in the area? Yeah, in the area. You know, yeah. so when you hear somebody, oh yeah, he's from Virginia, you, you you feel a type of way because it, it almost hits home, and so so yeah that's 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 DC. Um, what do you miss um, the most here in Europe from the states? I've been to the states a year, but in North Carolina, a bit south. Where in North Carolina? Uh, in Clayton, Clayton, uh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, North Carolina. Uh, it's it's I think an hour with a car from Raleigh. Raleigh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, nice. I have some friends. I also committed to Wake Forest, which is ah, okay, in yeah. Durham, North Carolina. Yeah. And so I, I'm, and my biological mom comes from North Carolina. Oh, really? So I, I, I'm a, the so the South. I'm, I'm familiar with, with, with New York. The, the Tar Heel. Yeah. What's it called? Chapel Hill. Yeah, yeah Chapel Hill. Yeah, the Tar Heel. You also have Duke University, which yes. is a good sports rivalry. Basketball. Yeah, crazy, crazy mm -hmm. rivalry in, in the South for that. Um, no, but you were raised basically in Silver Spring. Yeah. That was your hometown. Around, around that area. High just, school. Yeah, I went to school in Virginia, uh, DeMatha, and then also in Silver Spring. Yeah. So I've been Virginia, D.C., Maryland. Played for D.C. United, so yeah. I was in D.C. all the time for, for training and football. So yeah, born and raised in the DMV. Definitely. <laughs> definitely, definitely proud to say that. How did you... Wait, uh, do, what do you say? Uh, do you say football or soccer? Soccer. Soccer? Soccer. That's American. That's the yeah. American because we have football already. You get, in, in Europe, you guys don't have American football really, like as a dominating sport. Ten years ago, twenty yeah. years ago, you didn't have American football. Yeah. You just had football. Yeah. And so in in America, it's American football is what dominates the mm. sports. So I know. We, we call it soccer. Did you ever play football? I mean, American football. Yeah, football? I, I, I actually grew up playing football. Really? Was, yeah, my, my main my main sports was basketball and uh, football. Yeah. Uh, uh, Did you make the the the, home, the the high school squad? See, this is a thing. Um, I I think I, I was naturally born and made to play foot American football. But I was a little kid and had so much energy that my parents put me in every single. <laughs> Sport. Just put him everywhere. Just Come on. Everywhere just to get his energy out. And then I played both sports growing up. But then when I got to, to a higher level, um, the the soccer and football were in the same season. Mm -hmm. So they were both in the in the spring. And so I had to choose to play either football or or, America, or soccer. Mm -hmm. And so. You know, at the time I was a little skinny kid, <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I think maybe I got a better chance with soccer. Let's, <laughs> let's, 
you know, let's let's go with that. I also was adopted by uh, two European uh, foreign people. Oh, really? My adopted father is Iranian. My adopted mother is German. And I oh, really? thought it would be more relatable to play soccer because it's something uh, yeah. everyone can relate to. So, did you have a favorite uh, football club or player when you were a child? No, I never. I mean, did you do you did you know Barcelona or Real Madrid? Well, I was in the States and I never met someone who actually knew one single club from Europe or even from the States. No, growing, uh, growing up, I never, and even now, my whole life, I've never had a, a favorite anything. I never had okay. a favorite person. You know, I, I see these people as human beings and I just don't, I just see them just as that. I never had an idol. I know one time i think if i if i had to choose somebody growing up i i played in my soccer with my with my baseball shoes on you know growing up okay you know, there was the, and then i would go watch football you know it, that's that's just how it was but i think if i had to choose maybe an idol growing up i i, I asked for his book one day for uh for my birthday and it was david beckham Mm, and that yeah. was right around the time the movie Bended Like Beckham came out. Yes. Yeah. And I, I was, I loved that movie. I was a big fan of that. So if, if I had to choose one, I think it would be him. Or Ronaldinho. Yeah? Yeah, I remember, I remember coming to Germany with my adopted mom. And it was in the World Cup where Germany played Brazil. And I was... Which the, one? Uh, where, where they lost in the World Cup. I think 2002. it was 2-1. No, 2002. Could be 2002, but I know I know oh wait, Ronaldo you mean, scored you mean in the final. Ah, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's why I remember it so so clearly. No, it was uh, in the final of the game. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, that was 2002. I remember that with this who that squad. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you played for the DC United Academy, like you said, uh, for Southern Connecticut State University. Yeah, that was my first year in college. Yeah. Yeah, and then you uh, also played for the University of Central Florida. Yeah, UCLA. Correct. Yeah. And then you made the step towards Europe. Mm, no, first no? I was in uh, first I was uh, in uh, Rio de Janeiro for a year. I yeah, I, I read that. I was at Fluminense. Yes, you played there. How yeah, was it? Yeah. I think Brazil was the best experience of my lifetime. I think I I think yeah, it was the best time of my life. Uh, I grew the most as a human there, mm. as, a, as, a, as a person there, and also as a player. And I think, I think Brazil was the turning point in my life for a lot of things. It, uh, growing up, growing, maturing as a human mm. being, the things I saw there, the lifestyle, you know, I, I grew and I learned more than ever in Brazil. You were there a year? Uh, yeah, about a year, eight months or so, eight, okay. nine months. Yeah. And where did you play in the youth team or? With the U20 team. Ah, okay. Under, under 20. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I had a plan. Um, the, the plan there was never to play for them. I was never even supposed to be there for that long. How, how did it happen? Any plan. So, so I was supposed to just train there for three months. Mm -hmm. And um, I had an, an, an old trainer who, who was Brazilian who said that. Ah, up okay. And he was, he was my trainer since a little kid. Mm. And so after... After the uni, I, I wrote him telling him what I wanted to do, and he said he would check something out, and he said there was an opportunity in Brazil for me. And uh, I told him that my dream was to use, take advantage of my uh, German passport and, and go find, go play in Europe. And he says, okay, let's make a plan. Um, let's get you here training for three months, and then um, when you're ready uh, and I get the right feedback, then mm. we, will, we will place you in Europe. So I said, cool, oh great, I went there, I trained, I was trained for three months, had the time of my life, and uh, I ended up getting a knock on my knee, um, like. yeah, over there, and uh, the, the staff over there enjoyed me so much and, and thought I was a good enough player that they decided to keep me, mm. and they told me that I could stay and, and play with them, and so I got healthy and I was ready to move on, and so, yeah, the bid for, uh, I got healthy, exactly, and then I uh, ended up going to Luxembourg. Yes, FC. How do you call the club? Rodange. Rodange. Yeah, Rodange. How uh, so, um, the connection to Luxembourg? How did it? Um, so the connection in Luxembourg. So the Brazilian coach I knew knew yeah. some knew also in the soccer world in America is very small. Yeah. Very, 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 very small, and um, so they they uh, 
the Brazilian coach I knew, I also knew the other coach, he was an old coach of mine, and uh, he had many connections, and um, I got in contact with the guy, and they uh, had some had some um, people here over in Luxembourg, and so I had a trial over there, and then within 48 hours, okay. they said, we, yeah, we will offer you a contract. Can you tell us something, okay, then you played there in Luxembourg for how long, a year, a one year season? And a half. Okay. I, I came in the winter, and I left in, in the, the summer. summer. Yeah. So it was one and a half yeah. years. And, a half. and then can you tell us about your path? To Altona. Oh, okay. So the past that's the uh, yeah, some some years. Yeah, no, no, no. So I was in Luxembourg. Boom, left there. Went to Fab bit Umburg. Uh, signed a two-year deal there. Uh, things were going great when I first arrived, and then um, things went downhill mm. after an incident that happened. Um, also, at that time, I couldn't speak any German. I was yeah I was I was out so things went went, went pretty shitty over at Fab de Odenburg and okay I I, uh, I lost the the love of the game I, I, re I seriously yeah I didn't enjoy football anymore I wasn't happy I wasn't excited going to training yeah um and it was it was a personal it was personally it was because of the trainer you know and okay yeah you know I I don't want to go into detail. Everyone no, knows no, you my don't story and yeah. stuff, but I lost the love of football, and it was things that were out of my control that I couldn't even control. So it wasn't even something like I, if I wasn't working hard enough, or any, you know, it was really out of my hands. Okay. Anyway, stuff. Um, I I ended up quitting football. I, I was so unhappy, hated it. I quit my contract with Falfe, and I had my best friend. Uh, he played in the Bezirksliga. Mm. For, for and uh, I just said, you know, fuck it, you know, I'm gonna play with you, you know, enjoy football, you know, try and find the love back. And I was at Mundelo, I think, for three months, and I was so happy. I was, I loved football, I fell in love with it again. And then um, the old, when I was super unhappy at Foul Fair, the manager, Ralph Folk, mm. that. When I was done with Mundelo, he ended up becoming the, the team coach of Brema Asfal. Yeah. And in, in, in so he he, uh, he knew the situation, what went on, and so he reached out, and uh, we spoke, and then he told me he was being the trainer there, he would love to have me, blah, blah, blah. I said, okay, cool, I'll give it a try. We spoke about what happened to Oldenburg, so I felt like he, he, he came from the heart. I ended up playing with him. We had the craziest season. I think we, we didn't lose one game or something, and it, yeah, we we were we were so good, and that's also where I was with Marcel. Mm. That's how I know Marcel was from playing last fall, mm. and he was also at Oldenburg. And uh, okay, now which brings me to the story how I got to Altona. We had a great season. We were getting ready for the promotion games. And the first game we play is playing as far against Altona. Yes, I, I remember. Okay, so everyone knows my, We've been there. my famous PK. No, come yes, on. My PK. <laughs> I heard some fans say that I did it on purpose so then I could come <laughs> to Who Altona. said that? Yeah, <laughs> it's a lie. I've heard about that. I've heard many things. But, um, Sorry. So yeah, we ended People up talk. Uh, playing Altona in the promotion games and ended up losing 3-2 with a little bit of my hope. And... Um, and after the promotion game, um, yeah, I take, received a phone call of interest from um, um, Altona. Mm. You know, so I think Marcel was, was being spoken to by Altona at the time, and he mentioned my name to, to Altona. And so they, yeah, they, they took a further look, and we, Marcel and I, came down to Altona and met with Bur at the time, mm. Berkman and and uh, the team manager, and uh, yeah, it happened so fast, we met, and then I think for two, three weeks later, we came down, we, we signed a contract, yeah. got our stuff, and boom, Move. came, yeah. came on, the, I think, the, 20, the 23rd or 28th, I remember it was a Thursday, <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy how these little things, and boom, the rest is history. If you're fine now, we would like, uh, I would like to talk about politics, don't hold back. Um, are you following the politics in the U.S. in the U.S. and what are your thoughts about it? Um, yes, I am following the politics right now in America, and um, 
right now I would say hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, this whole 2020 with Trump in office and I did you vote? That is, of course, I voted. Yeah, hundred percent, I voted <laughs> here and, uh, in Hamburg. Uh, no, I voted online. I got my stuff online. Ah, okay. And it got shipped to me, and then I, I filled out the paperwork and sent it back to my dad, and mm. he sent it into the to the polls. Um, but but yeah, I, um, this was the first year I actually voted. Last year I wanted to vote. Um, Last time. I mean, no, first with Obama was when I was my first time voting, and then this time I, I voted again. Um, but yeah, there, there's so much to say. Um, First of, of all, first of all, I want to say in, in, in on behalf of all Americans, because when I speak to Europeans or other people about um, America, oh, you're American? The first, where are you from? The first, the yeah. first question is, so what about Trump? Ah. So what about <laughs> Trump? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Please believe me when I tell you, Trump does not represent all Americans. By, I know. Oh, by any means. By any means. And, um, yeah, thank God that he's out. Um, there's just too much to say. Too much has gone on in America right now. And, and, and I think he was the, the... He's just the worst person to be the... To represent such a powerful yeah, and country. important country um, to the world. And, and yeah, it just doesn't, doesn't do America justice. And I'm sure you've heard about Americans being very patriotic and having a lot of pride. And I, and I have of a course. lot of pride of being American, but to be honest, during the time of Trump, I was very embarrassed to be American. Mm. I did not feel prideful at all, and it's not something I felt proud of, you know. But now... <laughs> now we're back in the game. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do you speak about uh, Do you speak about it with your friends and family from back home? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, was, I was the chatting. Oh, man, I've... I, I can I have I have friends from ev from all all types of races and uh, all different political backgrounds, but majority of the people agree on the on um, on the basic terms, you know, the basic ideologies that um, even if Trump is in office is in office, there gives no right to sit on a man's neck for eight minutes and forty six seconds. These are just simple things, you know, that you agree upon. And also, one thing that I, I've spoken with, with some of my friends, some of my white friends, um, who are Trump supporters, mm -hmm. um, and, I, and, I, and I tell them, like, because we have the, um, the Proud Boys, you know, in that movement. And it, my question is, you see Trump in front of all America, millions of people, he won't directly answer a question, but when he indirectly answers something, it puts gas to, uh, mm -hmm. to it puts oil to a flame, you know. And then my and then and then it gives you the question: Do you think Trump is racist? And you're asking a white person who's a supporter of Trump, and them being biased is, ah, oh, no, no way, there he's racist. He hasn't said anything racist. And then it's, you know, then it's a never-ending conversation. But at the same time, it's important to have these conversations because, you know, I feel one way about a certain situation. So for me to give my light and shed light on something, or someone from a different opinion, is important because it fills in the blanks. Also, mm -hmm. I think it's important for me to hear and listen to a Trump supporter because I can hear things that I don't normally agree on, and then I can decide where to, to find the balance at. So, you know, I think these conversations are super important to, to have, but at the same time, I think when you do have these conversations, you must be open-minded and not biased to, mm -hmm. to them. Um, because that will not end up in an intellectual conversation, it is just end up in a fight, arguing back and forth, who's right, who's wrong. You know, what Everybody has his point. Either it's not one person who's 100% right, it's not one person who's 100% wrong. You know, it's finding the balance between and coming to a to an understanding or a middle ground point. And if, if something, wh why does it need to be discussed that, you know, black lives matter? Oh, yeah, but all lives matter. Yeah, yeah, we know all lives matter. But if you believe all lives don't matter until black lives mm -hmm. matter, we get your life matters. 
But do you think a, a black officer would sit on a white man's neck for nine minutes and everything be okay and not get charged? Like, that's, you're missing the point of, of what we're trying to say. We get all lives matter. But all lives, how can you say all lives matter when you're not treating all lives the same? You know? Yes. And so it's these important combos to have. And, and, and it, I think it's so just so simple and so obvious if... If um, Trevor Noah, who is a uh, who does that, you watch it? Oh, I love Trevor Noah. He was talking Me about too. his thing, <laughs> talking about you know, if he, and he gave an example of a police officer who um, there was a guy who uh, felt he he was done wrong by a police officer, so he ends up shooting a bunch of police officers, um, and then he goes hides in the woods. Yeah, and then those police officers. It wasn't just one or two of the police officers. It was like at least a hundred police officers who surrounded the that man's forest. the forest, and just he was soup. Aye, aye, aye. So it and then it brings you the question. So we a black man sees another black man being killed by a white officer, and you wonder why how why we riot and why we loot. Look at it, the example of the police officers. They killed one of yours. Mm. And so you wanted to get back. You killed one of us, so now you're questioning why we want it. You know, it's the same thing. It goes both ways. And whether black or white, orange or purple, right or wrong, you know right or wrong. And you know that it was complete murder and it's not right. There is no Black Lives Matter. There is no, you know, at the end of the day, you cannot unjustify that. You know, whether you're white, whether you're black, whether you're Asian, anybody who watches that videos will know that's not okay. And that's point, that's mm. done. There's no nothing less that needs to be said, nothing more that needs to be said. It was wrong. As we know, white silence is violence and this topic needs a lot of reflection, listening and understanding. So I would like to ask you about your thoughts um, yeah, mm -hmm. on the Black Lives Matter movement over the recent month and how it has reverberated around the world. I was in awe when I was at the, uh, um, here in Hamburg by the, uh, the church, the dem demonstration, I was, my jaw dropped how many people came out and yeah. supported. Ah, yeah. And that was super, super yeah. touching. And then you saw in, in uh, uh, then you saw with the Bundesliga, then you saw in London, mm -hmm. for every soccer game, they had Black Lives Matter. And this, the world really, really, really took to it. And I think that was just gives you goosebumps. The fact that the whole world supports and is behind it and understands that there is a problem. And you know, it's it goes first of all, it started in America with the Black Lives Matter, and now it's gone across the whole world where it's not just about black lives in America, but now it's in general. Now it's it's a racist, um, it's a racism issue that is, is, is across the world, not just for black people in America, but black people all around the world. And then this movement allows people and allows, shed, allows light to be shed on racism, not just towards black people, but racism everywhere, between everybody. Mm. And um, I've always said it's super interesting being in America and coming to Germany, because in America, when you see racism, it's really like white people are racist to blacks or people are racist to Mexicans. You know, and then here coming to Germany, the racism is still very alive, but it's not black, white, and Mexican. Now it's more like Turkish. It's the Germans and how the Turkish and the refugees and the foreigners. Mm -hmm. And it's and it's interesting to see, you know, it's the racism is still they both in both countries, but now it's just with two different types of ethnicities. Mm -hmm. But it's still very well there. And so <laughs> Would you tell us about the everyday racism that black and brown people experience here or in the U.S.? I mean, here in Germany, I, I feel so safe here in Germany. Yeah. I feel, oh, you know, when I see police drive by or put their horns, I don't even think twice. I feel so comfortable and safe because the cows would... The things that they do in America, like I've I've gotten dealt with shit where I've been in the car and I've had my blacks friends and we've had nothing in the car. Mm. One of us goes to jail because they found a gun or they found cocaine or they found drugs or they found alcohol, you know. But we never had it to begin with. But that's it. That's every day. That's normal. What you deal with over over there, and that's that's why it's so scary because you can really 
it doesn't matter if you did something wrong or not. It just mm. matters what mood the police officer is in, you know? And that's, <gasps> that's such a big difference between Germany and America. Mm. I will never worry about a police, a German police officer planning something in my car. Never. Never. I don't think that will happen here, but those are just every day, every time you hear a siren. I'm driving and the siren goes off over there. I'm shaking now. I'm already shaking thinking he's coming for me because it's, it's, it just becomes normal. You know, when, 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 when I grew up, this was even my adopted dad. Like, my adopted dad is, not, is Iranian. Mm. And, he, and I'm not even fully black, but he knows what it is yeah. as being a colored or a brown skin in America. And growing up, an Iranian father taught a black kid how to put his hands up, how to act when you get stopped at a, a traffic stop or at a light or by a cop. Mm. That's the fact that a foreign parent is so aware of how it is of a situation that he knows he has to teach his kid how to act just because. To survive. Just to survive. Mm. And it's just... You know, that, I think that speaks volume the fact that he is so aware of that and knows that that's how it is. That he is is woke enough to know he has to educate his kid because his kid will go through this one day. You know, and so now imagine being in a, in a family like that and, and yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. What do you think, why is this police violence and death in custody of BPOC in Germany not a big problem? Topic. Because you guys don't have the, the, the history and the culture of slavery like we do. Everyone in the world has slavery, but slavery in America was not the same way slavery in Germany was. You know, if, if, if I, I don't know much, much of the history of slavery in Germany, but um, yeah, it, it goes back to the history. And, and I was explaining this to my girlfriend the other day. Um, a white friend of mine, his grandfather, was a slave owner, or, or here my, my 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 biological mom was 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 white and she was from Raleigh, North Carolina, mm -hmm. um, and and she was half white and she was mixed and uh, her grand her great grandfather was a slave owner, her great grandmother was a slave, and you see the 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 years. It's my mom's grandmother. Mm -hmm. that's, that's 50, 60 years. That's nothing. So slavery is still very fresh and very, very real, like live to this day. So it's not that long ago that there was slavery. So it's still installed into people. The older generations, the 80 years old, the 70 year old men, white men and women, all they, all they know from their parents is slavery. And then it just gets instilled from generation to generation. That's why it's, you know, it's nowhere near like it was, but it's still very, very present in, in many different ways. And I think it's because, like to answer your question, what makes it so different but in America than in Germany is because our history is not that long ago mm. that we were dealing with it. Thank you for your answers. answers. Um, another topic, another important topic. Um, did you hear about the homophobic incident in San Diego where uh, Lennon Donovan and his team abandoned a match back in March after an homophobic insult towards a member of the team? Oh, wow, I didn't hear about that. No? No, no, no. Lennon Donovan, he's still playing? No, he is a coach okay, okay, for okay, San okay. Diego Loyal, I guess, or Loyals. Okay. And um, the story was that in one game, some player got hit by a racist uh, slur yeah. and then in the 71st minute and then the next game they said all right um, it's bad what happened and we would like to stop in the 71st minute to remember that moment in the game before so there was first a racial harassment mm -hmm. and the game after in the first half uh, one team member uh, got, uh, no, hopefully, hopefully I get this right. Um, there was, from the other team, some player uh, slurred to him, homophobic. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
then Leon, uh, Leonard Donovan said in the break, hey, referee, did you hear this? You have to get him off the field. He said, blah, blah, blah. I don't know, uh, uh, but I think it's something like, I didn't hear it right. I don't know so what it means. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah. Same, same, all over again. Uh, Leonard Donovan went to the other coach, please take him off. We won't play. And then the coach said, no, I don't. And then uh, Leonard Donovan said, all right, um, we go, we walk. Go and then uh, the season for uh, San Diego lawyer were over pretty much. No, good. Good um, for Leonard Donovan. Yeah. Good for him. Is this something, uh, is this a topic you players talk about here? Or do you, is no, this a topic? You know, um, we've never openly discussed uh, in, in Altona or in my other teammates, we never openly discussed uh, about um, having homophobic issues or the topic in general. Um, I've had I've had in the past a team. I had a teammate who was gay, but during the time we were playing, he never said anything. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, and I think with m all male sports and football and these all male team sports being very masculine sports, I think people who who are gay or, or, or bisexual or transsexual or whatever, I feel I feel as if they don't feel confident or they they are resistant in speaking up because they're afraid of the response they will get. So they say um, being in an all masculine team sport, you know, you won't feel, imagine you open up about the guys about your, your sexuality and mm. then you have to go shower with them and you don't want them to feel uncomfortable and you don't want to feel uncomfortable yourself. So, you know, you're afraid to bring up the topic and so therefore you stay in your bubble and things aren't said. Um, I can't speak for everybody here, but I, I, you're on a team sport, it's not your sexuality that helps us win or lose games. So I don't think that's what you need to be judged by. I think as a, when you play on a, on, on a sports team, you're judged based off what you contribute. Um, not your outside antics. Mm. I would I, I personally don't have a problem with that. I think I see everybody as a human and, and needs to be respected and treated. So, all right. Thank you for your answers. At the last, at the end, I would like to ask you what plans we have in general for your future in soccer. Ah, uh, my future, my future in football. I'm 28, as you know, so I think I got a few more years to go. Um, my, my future with soccer is, uh, I, I'm actually super happy and humbled right now, so my, my plan is, uh, unless it's a big time contract, I can't say no to, mm. my, my plan is to stay in Hamburg and, and play here um, for a bit, and um, right now my focus is just to get back on the field and play and make sure I, I do my part to make sure Altona stays in, in the league. Uh, last question, last but not least, uh, uh, where is it? I hear. How do you imagine the first game after the pandemic in a hopefully sold out Adolf Liga Kampfbahn? Uh, well, I think with, with fans. Of course. Okay, no goals Sold left. out. No seat left. Everyone, everybody's in. Well, I think it's the place to be. I think you have IRK full, good weather, bumping, loudness. I think, yeah, I think it's the place that you would want to be at. I think it would be. See our, see our second win of the season. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. Good vibes, good energy, good atmosphere. I think I think on the first day when it is what we say it will be, I think people will will really see what they missed and and you know a void will be filled. You know, so a part of them that was missing will be back in their lives. Yeah. You know, for me yeah, that's I know how that's how it that's how it will feel. Thank you, personal for you. All the best, and with the team. Hopefully, you win. We win. We, we win. Us. We we win a second time. <laughs> so we need that. We need a to. lot more. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you. I have to thank also uh, the helping hands for this interview. Thanks a lot. And uh, yeah, stay healthy and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>